All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to attend this meetup. Um, uh, we're focusing on tagging content for empathy. Uh, and uh, this has been, uh, for a few years now, been an interest of mine, um, kind of a side research, poking around the edges kind of topic. Um, so uh, I kind of want to, and, and I'm, I'm really enjoying the, the ability to talk to other people about it and get their insights and their thoughts on it. So basically this is, as it says here, an exploration. All right, so we're, I do a bit of introductions. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, empathy and its, um, you know, the definition, um, why it's important, um, and more importantly, why the need for context is so key. Um, and then talking about kind of the practical aspects, it's one thing to talk about this in a, uh, you know, intellectual academic type. Uh, focus, but to really do this in a practical way um, for uh, integrate, you know, for creating compelling content, creating compelling experiences. Um, that's kind of another uh, a whole another kit and caboodle, as we say. Uh, and then I'll have some some final thoughts. Okay, so let's get started. So Paula gave me a really great uh, uh, introduction. So that's um, so I won't go into that, but I just want to say that. Um, as, a, as a former librarian, I'm a big organizer. I love gadgets. And I, according to Kevin, my business partner, who is, who is on this call, he thinks I entirely own way too many pairs of black shoes. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and I'm not giving up my shoes. I just want to say, state that here and there. Uh, so let's move on. So um, again, uh, Avenue CX, uh, co-founded with Kevin Nichols. Uh, we're a consultancy focusing on enterprise content strategy. We focus a lot on personalization and omni-channel focusing on performance content solutions, performance-driven content solutions. And so that's enough about um, me. I, of course, as the former librarian, I have to put a picture of a card catalog because I made, made Kevin do that. Okay, so let's move on. So why this topic? Why? Okay, so basically what happened was is that I was at a content strategy, uh, no, I'm sorry, I was at a digital asset management conference and I was contributing and I was on this panel and they, um, and it was sort of, what is the future of digital asset management platforms? And um, I made a comment to say that I would like to see more, uh, I would like to see more empathy represented in asset tagging. Now, originally this was meant specifically for images, but of course it applies to all types of content. And so conversations ensued, discussions, and I decided I wanted to dig into this topic more. Um, so uh, here, these are my thoughts based on research, interviews, um, and, uh, it's an exploration. So I would really like to, um, you know, this is a part of a discussion, this is a conversation, so feel free to contribute. All right. So on empathy itself. Um, so before we get into that, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, my story is um, about a little bit about me and a little bit about empathy. Um, so I suffer from tinnitus um, based, uh, uh, and basically that was a offshoot of what's called Meniere's disease, which um, for those who are familiar with Huey Lewis in the news, Huey Lewis now um, also has Meniere's disease and I feel badly for him, but it's awesome that somebody famous actually has the same thing I do because now people actually can, you know, it's, it's a little bit more public and out there. So like, so again, I feel badly for the fellow, but yay, somebody who's sort of spreading the word about um, this particular condition. Um, and I've had this condition for the, about the past 25 years. And what this does is one of the um, um, uh, fallouts basically is that I have ring or tinnitus in my ear 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, so if you ever remember coming out of a really loud bar or a really loud concert and you have ringing in your ears, well, I get that all the time. And what's really awesome is that if the air pressure changes, the tonal value of the tinnitus changes based on the air pressure. 
So I'm now a human barometer. So that's awesome. Uh, so basically I've adjusted, it's totally fine. I move people around the dinner table so I can hear them better. Um, I used to have a good friend of mine who would constantly be talking to me during, um, when we would go out to see, to the movies, drove me crazy. So she sat on the right side of me, she could talk to me all she wants and I couldn't hear a thing. It was awesome. It worked out great. So Recently, a good friend of mine got an ear infection and started to experience tinnitus like I did. Also getting migraines, which is again another, another uh, side effect um, associated with tinnitus. And he was complaining about this, you know, what it was the impact it was having on his day, his work, et cetera. And I knew exactly what he was going through. So, and this was probably the first time he truly experienced what I go through on a daily basis. Um, and for so long, and I felt badly for him because it's not fun. Um, but I couldn't help but say, welcome to my world, bucko. This is how, this is how I live all the time. And I, I do, I actually embedded a sound file, which I won't play because one, it's annoying. And two, there are links to similar sound files on YouTube in this presentation, which will be sent out. Um, but um, let's just say that it was kind of an epiphany for my friend to understand how, what I go through all the time. So when we're talking about empathy, um, it's all about understanding where somebody else is coming from. So let's talk about that in more detail. So there are three types of empathy. Um, one is cognitive. So this is emotional recognition the perception and accurate identification of what's essentially called the feeling states of others, how someone else is feeling. Then there's emotional, which is also called affective empathy. And it's the mirroring of the, again, the feeling states of others. And then there's compassionate. So the feelings of sympathy, concern, and compassion for another. This is often considered the consequence of the first two forms of empathy. And typically this type of empathy is the most socially desirable. There's a really awesome um, video explaining empathy by um, uh, Dr. Brown. Um, I've included the link to the YouTube, um, the, the YouTube video on, um, in, in the, um, in the presentation, so please do avail yourself because it's actually, it's a cartoon, it's kind of fun and it's very emotive, it's, it's great. Okay, so in short, empathy is being able to walk in another person's shoes no matter how much those four inch heels hurt you. And as owner of three inch platform heels, I can identify and yes, they're black and I'm still not getting rid of them. Uh, so when we talk about empathy in that, so it's also important to understand that empathy is a skill. It can be taught and it can be learned. And it's an essential building block of what's called social intelligence. We also often hear about emotional or social intelligence kind of known as the emotion intelligence quotient and how empathy plays a part in creating uh, this kind of state of mind. Um, for many people, empathy is a key part of their personal and professional success. Uh, sales, um, retail, um, being able to, uh, you know, interact with people um, is, is, and empathy as a part of that is really important. But what does that mean for our brand? So why is it important? So in thinking about it in terms of a brand context, it essentially describe, creates a distinctive in the moment experience and provides highly relevant content. So there's been a lot of talk, a lot of uh, you know, discussion about the importance of personalization and how you wanna personalize things, even you know, from you know, the basic email to a website experience, what have you, but essentially, you know, taking that to the next level, sort of highly relevant content that is specific to a person. So I have this quote from Anne Handley, um, and I use this a lot, um, and it's, even when you're marketing to your entire audience or customer base, customer base, you are still simply speaking to a single human at any given time. 
And I think that's really important because when we're talking about engaging with a person and increasing and thinking about increasing that brand loyalty, the lifetime engagement beyond that simple flashpoint of a sale, um, and essentially amplifying that interest in the brand beyond what could be considered an initial customer base. And I also put this quote in from Wayne Newton because I think he's a hoot and holler. Um, I miss personalization that Vegas was. There were showroom captains and all the dealers knew, knew the gamblers by their first name. So it's that interactive, yes, I understand who you are type of experience. So um, I pulled together a few examples, some older, some newer, about um, examples of empathetic content in a variety of formats. The first one is um, a clothing company, MM4. They have an online presence as well as several pop-ups. Um, they focus on image and text. And essentially they've created long form biographies with compelling portrait images to tell a person's story. They explored a woman's ups and downs, successes, encounters, and so on. So what's the payoff here? Why, why bother with it? And the payoff is that it's a clothing store that's more than just about clothing. It helps to sell the product at the but, but um, because at the bottom of the bio, the page displays other outfit recommendations based on the particular subject, subject's clothing in the images. But if you were to remove all the, all the, the, the sales piece, you would still have very compelling content. Um, the next example is a virtual reality experience. And this one um, helps people understand how autistic people perceive their environment. Um, uh, and the one that they have here, um, and I linked to both in the, in, in the, um, in the, uh, the slide deck, is it's a self-directed exploration with 360 views, including incidents sparking environmental stimuli. So it mimics how autistic people perceive their environment. So you understand how they um, feel bombarded by, you know, sharp sounds and loud sounds, um, too much light. Um, and it, it, it helps to provide an understanding of what other people are going through. Um, there's also a walkthrough a video with no specific exploration, which provides a similar experience. So my point here is, is that experiential content helps to queer, create awareness of a condition at a level that could not be communicated through text or images. So this next one is specifically a video. Um, it is a, uh, this particular one is a, uh, for Under Armour. So this, this is Misty Copeland, who is a, um, a, a ballerina. And she was the uh, first African-American to be promoted to the principal dancer, dancer in American Ballet Theater's 75 year history. And the video, um, shows her performing a dance while in a ch while child's voice reads her rejection letters. Um, and it, the brand correlation here is that we all like an underlaw dog and we like associating with brands that represent determination and grit. And I don't know where this red line is coming from, but it's really bizarre. Uh, not exactly sure where that's coming from. So apologies on that. Okay. All right, so next. So now I wanna talk about the need for context. Um, what is it that we're thinking about with regard to context? Um, so we're talking about empathetic experiences. Yes, we want to engage with the brand, but in order to engage with a brand, we need to, um, we need to think about the context in, in that piece. So let me, and I figured out how to clear this and I wanna get out of this and then I wanna to go to the next page. All right, perfect. So when we talk about context, there's lots of different kinds of context that we need to think about. So 
when, when, and this is actually very uh, uh, germane to global brands, but it can apply to all brands. So when we think about culture, what is your way of life, um, which can differ when you're living within the same country? As someone born and raised in the Midwest and who's been living on the East Coast for 20 plus years, I can certainly attest to this. And that people still continue to slap an R on the back end of my name when it's not appropriate. Um, it's just one of those things you get used to. <laughs> uh, when you think about education, you know, education level is key here, but also associations with uh, college or university experiences, especially, for example, in sports, um, when you, people very much, um, my uncle very much considers himself a corn husker, even though he's lived in California for the last 30 years. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a way of thinking um, in, in a one person's context, but also thinking about how that applies to the content you're trying to deliver that person. Um, income. So for certain brands, understanding income is extremely important. Is it affordable? Is it ex exclusive? Is it trendy? Will I look cool? Um, what's the latest and greatest? Do I have the right, you know, do I have the latest and greatest tennis shoe? Uh, and ethnicity, where do you feel at home? Um, who are your people, essentially? And this can be small or large groups. Um, and it can be um, where you feel the most comfortable. And then we talk about social norms. So what is it socially acceptable to you? Again, this could vary widely within a group or geographic area. Um, there are certain social norms that are acceptable in some countries and not so much in others. Okay, so let's talk about perceptions and reality. Um, essentially, words matter. Um, terms we use impact the content experience. So um, one of my clients uh, currently is a semiconductor uh, firm, and they are trying to figure out how to stop using um, terms like master and slave, which um, does not resonate with potentially many of their customers. Um, terms can also require a historical context. So um, Korean conflict actually was only an accepted phrase um, for a certain time frame, and then it was okay to call it the Korean War. Um, so when you look at historical um, references at a certain time frame, it was it was it was officially the Korean conflict until it then became the Korean War. There are also terms that are very much dependent on region and culture. Um, I discovered this when um, a I was gifted a really great um, book on um, it was a really great cookbook. Um, and it was written by, it was a friend of mine who's from Australia. And I thought, okay, great, this is so good. And I, I came across a recipe I really wanted to try and it referred to rocket. And I'm like, what the heck is rocket? I don't know rocket is, right? Isn't that rocket? That's the thing that goes to the moon, right? But no, actually rocket is used as a term in the UK and Australia to refer to arugula. And so when we think about you know, regionalization and personalization and thinking about the terms that people use, you know, that's super important. Another thing we talk about is, um, uh, you know, precise language. So, and the lack of it. So particularly in the medica, medical or pharmaceutical world um, where um, the, wrong, the wrong term could mean death, literally. Um, if things are mistranslated or if you're in a hospital and you're not using the right term and you think about these things, um, they, can, they can create a, a big problem. When we think about images, one image can have multiple interpretations. So um, I picked a few famous ones. So we have the, the duck versus rabbit on the left and then the Rorschach on the right and thinking about that in, um, you know, what is that thing? What is it? What is it to me? Um, and is informed by who we are as individuals, as well as members of different groups, family, worth, ethnic, et cetera. And I think it's a rabbit, but I grew up on a farm. So that's me. 
And then we talk about images. They also tell impactful stories and exist within their own context. So on the left, we have a New York City celebrating um, in Times Square, the surrender of Japan at the end of World War II. And it was a quote with this image. They threw anything and kissed everybody, anybody in Times Square. And would kissing anybody today really be acceptable? The two in this photograph actually were not related. I mean, we're not even boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, this fellow had randomly gone up to this woman because he thought she was a nurse and she was a dental assistant and kissed her with his girlfriend kind of like trailing behind him. Um, so when we talk about like, oh, isn't this wonderful? Isn't this celebratory? But in a certain context, it might not be that way. And on the right, we have gold medalist Tommy Smith and bronze medalist John Carlos showing the raised fist on the podium the podium after a 200 meter race at the 1968 Summer Olympics protesting racial discrimination. Both wear Olympic Project for Human Rights badges. Peter Norman from Australia also wears the same badge in solidarity with Smith and Carlos. So this seems like a really um, empowering moment, something that we should all embrace. But the aftermath after this event Smith and Carlos were largely ostracized in the US sporting establishment and they were subjected to great criticism and essentially um, pretty much ruined their careers. So perception changes over time. And then we talk about context gone awry. Um, to build empathy, you need to have a certain level of trust. So the creepy personalization, overly pushy content will backfire on a brand. So personalization used in tandem with empathy needs to be carefully planned or it will wreak havoc with the brand standing. So for example, on the left, we have a woman whose dad is in assisted living and he receives a Christmas basket from a local mortuary, which is kind of intense, honestly. Um, and this is an older example, but, um, Target uh, used a massive collection of big data to determine if a woman was pregnant or not. Based on this data, the company sent out targeted mailers to a pregnant teen focusing on baby products, even before her father was informed of the pregnancy. This type of interaction can make feel, people feel they have a lack of control over their data and markedly reduces any ability to create an empathetic experience. Here we have a, um, an attempt to incorporate events into a brand story, which can backfire. On the left, Aisha Evans during protests against police brutality in Baton Rouge. This image went viral and resonated with many. On the right, Kendall Jenner, Jenner in a Pepsi ad that was seen as tone deaf and playing fast and loose with protest imagery. Um, and uh, I'll read Pepsi's, uh, official response. Pepsi was trying to project a global image of unity, peace, and understanding. Clearly we missed the mark and we apologize. We did not intend to make light of any serious issue. Um, and so, and a lot, this has been happening, happening honestly a fair amount. So another example is uh, Dolce and Gabbana's video advertisements in China, which were widely seen as racist and pandering to old stereotypes which I have um, links to in the description. So a lot of big brands are making lots of missteps with regard to perception of either the products they create or their intent of their advertising. So, okay, so where does that, where does that leave us? Okay, so we have lots of pitfalls and we have, but we wanna still create an empathetic experience. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, when we think in, think in terms of an empathy map, um, who is the user and who are the users and their context? Um, when we think about in terms of uh, audience, you know, you can think in terms of uh, segment, which is 
a division of the marketer population with, into subgroups with similar motiva motivations. So for example, like geography, um, demographic, you use a particular kind of product, um, level of expertise and so on. And then you have personas, which are essentially fictional characters or archetypes, which are created based upon research in order to represent uh, different user types that might use your service or your product or your site or your brand in a similar way. And then we focus on the communication goal. So what does the company or brand want to communicate? What do they want to relay to the, the client, the customer, the user, what have you? And then you have the emotional mindset of the user. Um, for example, in a retail context, it could be needs validation, got to be first, be done, um, buy and done with it, et cetera. In a more medical context, it could be, you know, get me the information I need. Um, I'm anxious, I'm worried. Um, I, I don't have time for, um, you know, over marketing BS. Um, you know, I just need, I'm looking for simple information. So when we need to think about that in that context. So here's a metadata example that I, and I use an image. Obviously there are additional types of metadata uh, for different kinds of content. I picked an image because honestly, I think it's the most difficult because it's, it doesn't have any text to help provide context. Um, so when you think about imagery, you have to go kind of the extra mile to really understand what the image is about. Um, so when we talk about this particular image, I picked because honestly, I thought it was fun and I liked the cat. Okay, so that's that's me. <laughs> and, but when we think about the context and the, you know, the, the image that we're looking at, so we think, okay, this looks like a train. Um, they're traveling somewhere. It looks like snow. Um, they're young, they're female, I guess they're friends. Um, they have a cat that may or may not be the pet or it might be just the cat hanging out. And remember, this is an internet-based presentation, so we had to have at least one cat. Um, so we have the audience itself, the context. So the segments could be like preteens, it could be parents, um, a persona could be, you know, I made this up, Sally the searcher, or however, uh, the, the, you know, the persona that you're focusing on for your, your branding. And then we have a communication goal, understanding and an emotional mindset. So somebody wants, somebody wants to understand what their inspiration is. So when we think about empathy input, um, it's all, you know, again, putting yourself in their shoes. So when we talk about walking the customer journey and understanding uh, what their path is and how they're getting to the content they need, and then relaying that customer story, everybody has a story and everybody is a hero in their own story. We don't imagine that we're villains in our own story. But we, are, but we are the central piece of our story and what we're trying to tell. And brands need to communicate how they can support that story. So you can also look at it as also um, using um, qualitative success measures. So when you're thinking about um, you know, using focus groups or sentiment measurements or in-depth interviews, et cetera, sort of understanding what that, that interaction is and it was it successful. Um, also thinking about gathering customer support feedback, call center feedback, and understanding where people are not happy um, versus where people are ecstatic. Um, typically when I interact with support, it's probably not, I'm not happy. I'm not happy because my thing doesn't work. Whatever the thing is, it could be any gadget I purchased, it could be my computer, it could be anything. But if I'm looking for support, I'm probably not happy. Um, so in understanding that kind of tone helps you um, provide information in a context that's more helpful. And also leveraging sales team input. So when you're looking at kind of the point of sale, you know, you're right at the cash register, you're ready to check out. 
Um, and also looking at kind of the direct sales, business to business, you work with distributors, you work with direct sales, um, and how does that work and how can you gather that feedback in order to improve the interactions with the content? Okay, so I'm like, great, so this is awesome. Great, we have an empathy map. Yeah, we can, we can do metadata. Um, yeah, I could pull together some tagging for a microsite or, you know, a small website or campaign, but how do we do this at scale? How can we make this, you know, for an entire website or for an entire internet experience that's not, you know, a small number of pages? Um, can it be done? So this is when we start bringing in artificial intelligence um, and machine learning. So as a science fiction nerd, I have lots of creative background and how writers have represented artificial intelligence and machine learning for some years. Uh, but the reality is, is that um, artificial intelligence can be loosely interpreted to mean incorporating human intelligence to machines. Um, whenever a machine completes a task based on a set of stipulated rules, it solves problems, also known as algorithms, and such an air quote, intelligent behavior is what is called artificial intelligence. Whereas when we talk about machine learning, it can be um, uh, empowering a computer with the ability to actually learn. And then you'll also hear um, a phrase called deep learning, which is essentially a subset of machine learning. And it's simply a technique for realizing machine learning. Uh, for example, deep learning is the next evolution of machine learning. And then you talk about essentially effective artificial intelligence, which aims to create artificial intelligence that recognizes and responds to our moods, our emotions, our facial expression, well over to nonverbal cues. Um, so that's awesome, but how does this help? How does this help us tag assets using empathy? Um, I'll get there, don't worry. Um, so when we talk about textual content, that's one thing, but images, because that's very complex. So I have three images here and it might not come across on the screen share, but the first one um, is an apple with the title, this is not an apple. Um, the water feature could be mistaken for a syringe and the interpretation of um, emotional state, laughing so hard that you were crying. As humans, with our experience, we have nuanced interpretations of these images, but artificial intelligence cannot always discern these differences. So now I'm gonna talk about the importance of data sets. So when you're talking about machine learning, deep learning, um, uh, you have a data set to start from. And uh, they're often called reference data sets and they can uh, vary in quality. Um, what was the decision criteria? Who was accountable? Why were they included? Um, our, you know, breadth versus depth. Uh, more does not always equal better. Uh, current data may not be representative of future trends and historically underrepresented factors may increase bias. So for example, if you have certain ethnic groups that weren't included in certain studies or included in, in certain research sets, you are now skewing the response. There is a, um, a, actually a very interesting Vox YouTube on um, photography and how they decided um, to, when um, Kodachrome came out and how they would, um, how it would be developed, they based it off of a, um, a white female and did not take into account, for example, if you took a photo of a black person or a brown person, how would it affect the development and the quality of the photographic image? So when we, we need to take into account all the necessary um, um, audiences and also make sure we have sufficient breadth. 
And then training and review. So when I say training, it's essentially helping the, mach the machine learn. And we need an ability to, to explain the outcomes of artificial intelligence and related unintended um, consequences. Um, organizations struggle to accept proper responsibilities for processes they cannot understand or control. So essentially, I mean, a lot of, um, a lot of this, um, you know, the already out there is available, the ability to auto tag or auto tag suggestors and things like that. But how quality is that? Um, for example, um, you know, a circuit board is a circuit board is a circuit board, but if you're looking at an image that is more fuzzy in its interpretation, how is machine going to understand what's actually going on? So all of this increases costs and is a potential barrier to entry. So um, I'm just gonna diverge just slightly. So um, this is an older example, but I think it's pretty telling. So in 2009, there was a canonical training set launched in 2009 used to tag images. Um, they included objects as well as people. And the way it classified people was very problematic. And that was discovered as part of an art project called ImageNet Roulette. Um, it revealed what ImageNet Roulette revealed ways in which people were tagged with racist and highly offensive terms. Flop, kleptomaniac, wanton, tosser, which is kind of my favorite. Um, and an image of a woman asleep in an airplane seat, right arm protectively around her pregnant stu stomach equaled snob. Um, it included many misogynistic and racist terms, which I cannot repeat in polite company. Um, so many of these images, objects and people, were categorized by the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, low paid, crowded source, crowdsourced labor, and whose work ultimately affected the AI they were trying to create or helping to create rather. So while some of the more problematic data sets were removed, it did not fully address the underlying problem, lack of transparency, understanding of the process and governance. So essentially machines are only as unbiased as the training sets they work with. So I included a quote between um, two of the collabor collaborators on this. And um, they essentially, and I put in a quote from them and I emphasized a certain portion of it. Um, there is no neutral, natural or apolitical vantage point upon that da training data can be built upon. So they felt it's not possible, can't do it. There's too much bias. And there are multiple opportunities for bias. So this is the Cognitive Bias Codex. Um, essentially, it is um, chunked up into four main sections. Um, what should we remember? Too much information, need to act fast, and not enough meeting. And I kind of took a chunk of that and blew it up a bit because it was impossible to display on the slide. Um, we are drawn to details that confirm our own existing beliefs, including confirmation bias, post-purchase rationalization, which is my favorite, favorite. Please see too many pairs of black shoes, um, selective perception, experimenters bias, observer's effect, um, ostrich effect, and more. Um, our own content context gives us bias, regardless of who we are. And so when we think about that, that in terms of trying to tag for empathy, we're thinking about, uh, we have to think about other people's context. It's super difficult because, you know, through my experience of working on taxonomies and metadata and tagging and things like that, um, even if you're trained, you know, a trained librarian, you're a cataloger, you, you know, you still, you know, you have to work to make sure you tag things so other people can find it. It's not so you can find it, it's so other people can find it or other people can interact with it. So where does that leave us? Remember our girls on the train? Are they both girls? What is your bias when you look at this image? 
Maybe you don't like snow. I'm from Wisconsin. I love snow. I'm used to it. My sister, she hates snow. She now lives in Florida. Um, but maybe it's ash. I mean, you can't really tell. Is it a ruined photograph? Um, maybe you don't like children, so you don't like this photo. Or maybe you love children. You think it's an awesome photo. You love children, but you don't like cats. You're allergic or whatever. Um, I personally think the cat's awesome, which is one of the reasons I chose it. Um, so bias exists everywhere. So where does that leave us with some final thoughts? So can we tag for empathy at scale? No, I don't think so. The future, maybe. Um, you know, it's all about creating those well-defined data sets. And I would propose that we include bias as part of the context of the tagging. We all have it, we can't get rid of it. It is what it is. I'm, I'm from the Midwest, I have a certain view of the world. People, my clients are, you know, one of my clients is from Long Island. He has a certain view of the world. And so when we think about that, might we consider bias as part of our context and think about that in terms of how we tag for empathy. It mitigates the risk because we know it's there. It creates more data, which is potentially a bad or good thing. Um, and it could potentially provide more relevant experiences because we think about it in, in a more real way, I, I guess I would state, that, that we understand where we're coming from, but we're trying to communicate to someone else. And isn't that what empathy is all about? So those are my final thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, and I am open to any questions, comments, scathing rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, I'm gonna I'm gonna assert organizer uh, privilege here and ask my question first, and then, and then we'll get to the other ones. I am I'm curious about just the actual brass tacks of doing this. So, you know, what do you when you're actually tagging content or image? Do you develop vocabularies that are emotion or intent or you know, kind of how yeah. how do you actually? So yeah, you would have to create a schema. You would have to create a metadata schema in order to capture those aspects that I noted in the empathy map, right? So what, what are the aspects that we wanna capture? And then also understanding how do we understand from a user perspective of what their context is so we can supply the right content based on the schema that we've created. So for example, you'll see, and I hate them, but you know, this is a very basic example. It's like, well, how did you like your support experience? I'm like, eh, I hated it. Um, that's not particularly helpful, but if you could um, perceive the amount of tension in a person's voice and understand, okay, they're under stress. So I'm gonna supply them a certain type of content over that has a certain tone of voice as opposed to some sort of happy-go-lucky tone of voice or some fun images that might not be appropriate. Um, but yeah, it would, it would um, and also you, when you're thinking about in terms of a cultural context, you know, so um, I was on a coffee ch chat with Scott Abel a couple of weeks ago and he brought up a really good example of, you know, so you're buying, um, uh, flowers at a flower shop for a funeral. So that certainly speaks to a particular context that you don't want um, uh, certain types of flower arrangements because you're at a flower shop and you're buying something for a funeral. Um, and so that provides some additional information for you. So if you are, if you are on the you know, sort of the content creation side or the you know image selection side or whatever, can you talk a little bit about how you sort of discern that customer context or intent and so that you know, you know, this person is probably frustrated or angry, so I'm going to serve them, you know, this piece of content or this the, that's written in this tone to sort of say, understood, you know, you're frustrated. Right. Here's, so how, that to, here's be, how to do this. Yeah. And, and that would, I think, require some detailed personas. So you would at least have that mapped out. So you would understand, okay, so... Um, this is this time at Persona, this is the time, kind of user we're, using, we're, we're dealing with. For example, um, you know, I, 
Um, you know, I have, you know, like, I'll just go back to like customer support because, you know, that can be a really angsty, um, uncomfortable experience because you just bought something and it doesn't work and I need it to work, right? Or um, as opposed to, I just want to download a driver or I want to fix a problem. And if one person takes me through a rote, um, or if I need something fixed and if one person forces me to go through answering a number of questions and I already told them all the answers, I mean, that's another type of experience. You know, you want to be able to understand, okay, hey, yeah, you bought, we, we, we've got your, we know what you bought, we know what the, 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 the version is, and okay, so what's your problem? Let's get this sorted kind of thing, as opposed to providing, oh, you want some fun things to add to whatever you bought, um, and understanding from that perspective of, you know, the specific types of people who would call in in certain situations or look for content in a certain situation. So it would require a, a fair amount of granular definition, you know, at least for the type of people that we're, that you're looking at, but also being able to tag for the content to um, map to that particular journey within a website or what have you. That's great, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And I, if there's time at the end, I would love to follow up with some specific questions about the engineering of that, like that that holy grail of matching, uh, you know, the user's context and intent with with content. But anyway, but first, let's ask David Hillis had a question about um, how to use empathy in a, in B two B marketing. And David, if you're on still on the call and want to unmute and elaborate on that, feel free. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so most of the examples I was looking at were all from, you know, B2C and very emotional. Mm -hmm. And, you know, B2B buyers obviously are, you know, a certain level emotion plays a role at a kind of a high level brand experience, but, you know, they often buy, you know, based on more pragmatic requirements. But sure. also in B2B, I was going to say that, um, you know, we talk a lot about the buyer's journey. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of systems out there now and more of account-based strategies that are kind of modeled around the buyer's journey. But I kind of feel like there's two buyer journeys, right? There's kind of the buyer journey from the seller's perspective, which is, you know, awareness, decision, purchase, et cetera. But then also, you know, buyers, like, they have a big challenge trying to justify a purchase internally and a lot of steps that they have to go through, which is a completely different journey, right? Correct. And I feel like in B2B, a lot of times we're focusing more on the seller's journey than the buyer's journey um, in terms of that empathy. Yes. So, yeah, just like your perspective on it. Sure, so there, yeah, I mean, yeah, you are correct and there's kind of like that less emotional, but then, but you look at it as, as you know, the less emotional or, touchy-feely or fuzzy or whatever you want to call it, but then you look at it in terms of, I can help you get your job done faster and cheaper. And wouldn't that be great for your bottom line? Um, you know, that, that, you know, that, that resonance of, I can help you do your job. Um, and so you can look at it in terms of, because somebody is not buying your product just to buy your product, they're buying it for, as you point out, a very pragmatic reason. They want to save money, they want to do something more efficiently, they want to sell more widgets, um, what have you. And what is that um, uh, key into why they want to buy a, a certain thing? Do they want to solve a solution? They want to create a solution? Um, you know, and then we have people who are, you know, to your point when it's focusing on you know, the people who are selling versus the people who are buying. And you look at the challenger sales approach um, when people are, are selling and challenging the buyer to think, well, this is what you said you want, but actually we think this is the other thing you need. And how can you do that without, you know, creating an acrimonious relationship? Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, I've been through several challenger, uh, just out of interest, through several challenger selling um, workshops and 
And uh, to, to be honest, it's like, okay, you're telling me to do, approach this in a certain way, but honestly, you're making me sound like a complete asshole. Um, and, you know, sort of thinking about that in terms of empathy and in terms of understanding where the buyer is coming from and what they're trying to accomplish and how you can make that happen. Um, so it's granted less emotional, but it's certainly, they, they have skin in the game. And, you know, in order to make that connection, you have to figure out what kind of skin in the game they have. Hope that makes sense. I appreciate that. Uh, And also I was going to say, so one thing that my company, Ingenix does, we do pro bono work for the Seattle International Film Festival, which is happening right now, by the way, if anybody's interested in it. But one thing we do is we use taxonomy to classify the film by mood. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a cool use of using empathy. I just yeah. dropped a link to it in the uh, chat, but you can see there's like... Oh, a, great. Yeah, thank you. A, I'm always looking selector. for examples. Yeah. I'm always looking for examples because I did do some work with a tourism board um, and they wanted to tag based on the type of experience that they wanted to provide. And I had a long discussion about them about what exciting meant for some people as opposed to other people. And they might want to choose something a bit more specific than <laughs> exciting. Um, you know, exciting for some people is, you know, doing base jumping where, you know, exciting for other people is, um, you know, going out to dinner. So it's, you know, you got to think about that in terms of, uh, the relationship that, you know, you're trying to, uh, bring with the brand itself for sure. Thanks for a great presentation. Thank you. I've got one other, um, Lorraine didn't, didn't phrase this as a question, but I'm curious if you have thoughts on this. Um, she was talking about in the, in the chat uh, that they were, that they had uh, struggled with their, uh, with, with tagging in, as they uh, worked on a photo library. Um, Lorraine, did you, is it okay to phrase that as a question? And did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Larry. Um, this was actually something I was trying to do because we like to show the diversity of our workforce and our um, patient and member base. I work for a healthcare organization. Mm -hmm. Um, And I thought it'd be great to tag in our, have a tag in our photo library for the ethnicity person, what uh, the ethnicity a person was in case we were doing kind of like a photo collage and we want, you know, a range of ethnicities. And I brought that up with a colleague and he was like, um, well, for example, and he typed up, he got looked at a photo. For example, what about this person? Is she Latina? Is she Asian? Or both. Is one of her parents Latino and the other Asian? Um, you know, and I realized a complicated path if we tried to do that. And I just kind of said, okay, never mind. We'll have to kind of just eyeball it every time. Yeah, it, it, it's tough. Um, you, you know, it's um, granted because, um, uh, you know, that your perception of how people look is, is very much colored of, you know, your background and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's almost, uh, you'd almost want to do, um, you know, the country of origin of the image, you know, or something like that. So you'd have that a little bit nailed down. And, it, and it's tough because, you know, we're becoming more and more a multicultural world. I mean, and, you know, you know, Keanu Reeves is part Chinese. I didn't know that until a few years ago. I wouldn't know. I'm a huge Bill and Ted fan. I, um, you know, I just, it, it, it's, um, and, and, and yeah, it, it, it's real tough because if you get something slightly wrong and then you're, you're facing blowback. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy, but then, um, you know, on the other side, if you're, you know, say you're a global medical organization, you certainly don't want to be showing images of white folks in South America. Right. Um, so it gets a little, it gets, yeah, it, it's, it's tough. It, it doesn't, it's not easy for sure. And I don't have a good answer for that. 
to be honest. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I was going to follow up, Rebecca, and ask about, <clears throat> can you maybe brainstorm about, you know, this kind of gets into professional practice about how to address something like that. I'm thinking here, for example, of that notion that, you know, not designing for people without including them in it. So, so, so to maybe if you were to embark on a tagging mission like that to get as diverse a team as possible working on it, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, that, that absolutely helps for, for, for certain. Um, and uh, it, it is, um, it is very much, it's so important um, because um, I worked uh, in the past, I actually managed a library with books, physical books. It was really weird. Really? I was like, wow. I came back from the interview. It was like, I'm like, they have books and fish and oh my gosh. But yeah. So, um, and, 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 and I must admit that experience, you know, I had, you know, uh, we had, my staff had, we were from Sierra Leone. We were from Hungary. Uh, we were from Wisconsin. Uh, we were from uh, uh, the South. And it, um, you know, it, 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 it really helped, uh, you know, um, form our understanding of how we serve our customers. Um, and, you know, we, you know, and we had, you know, uh, a woman, one of my staff was from India, you know, and so we all brought our collective perspectives when we served our customers, our, our patrons. And I, I felt that was super important. So I definitely do feel that having, you know, people from multiple, you know, a wide range of experiences, education levels, um, ethnicities, backgrounds, um, definitely does make a project I guess more real, I guess, you know, it's more, it's like, I don't know, I don't know, can I really say this? I'm a white lady from Wisconsin, but you know, it's, it's, you know, providing, getting that additional feedback and input from people who have gone through those experiences, for sure. Cool. Thanks. Hey, we have a question for, from Heidi. Heidi's one of our co-organizers. Um, and so Heidi, feel free to elaborate if you want. But, but Heidi asks, um, how do we tag for empathy when dealing with language, content, stories, campaigns? you know, variety of contexts. And, and Heidi, if you want to elaborate on that, feel free to. Um... Yeah, thanks. Because I entered that question um, midway through. And then, you know, towards the end, I'm, I'm seeing a slightly different vision. So I guess to that first question, you know, is there a way to, like, I just work with words, not the visuals. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I could tag would be, really content experiences. And I would also want to make sure that the language paired with the visuals, like someone could tag a visual for whatever, and I need to make sure the language goes with it too. Sure. When you're talking about voice and tone and when you're um, wanting to, um, you know, and that's, you know, probably part of your content brief as well and understanding what the content purpose is because you have a purpose in, in, in writing right. something, you have a purpose, you want to communicate something, obviously, you know, whatever it is. And when you look at the content purpose, that helps inform kind of those other pieces. So um, even in the imagery, you know, the accompanying imagery that you would want to use. Um, and, um, but when you're, when you're tagging image assets, you know, it's it's difficult and it's one of those things where governance and review and you know double you know learning and teaching the ai engine or whatever you're using in order to provide that necessary um, bridge between the text that you're writing and the voice and tone and the image that you use to go along with it um okay. and i'm not saying it's easy uh yeah. but it's it, it it's something that you know, I think initially, you know, uh, it would be have to be carefully curated until you kind of got feedback and understood kind of the direction of where you were going, particularly with regard to in, in images, you know, sort of like color choices, um, what's in the image itself, you know, also with the cultural context of, you know, certain colors are, you know, considered um, bad luck um, or good luck. Um, you know, flower choices, for example, or something like that. 
um, all of that, you know, has a language within itself. Um, so I'm also though, I have to insert because even as you're saying this, my mind is like, oh, this is so exciting. This is so exciting because like, I can also see the idea just of tagging for empathy or tagging this way to help with governance internally of assets, you know, yeah, especially yeah. when you have people, you know, you want to open up asset libraries and let people um, not block people and let them choose their own um, things. So I, I well, so yeah, <laughs> it's tough. To it's tough. That. But sometimes <laughs> you have to like open that up. But the other thing is, is that I really see a benefit like having worked in user support where people might answer like, was this helpful to you? And they come back and they say no. And then being able to serve, you know, get a sense of where their problems are and how I could serve up other articles that might align and help them with where they are in their product journey. And having yeah. empathy for, you know, the difficulties that like if they're experiencing this difficulty they're probably experiencing this one too and we have an article for that let's surface it to them right right yeah absolutely absolutely and when you think in terms of uh you know making it easier it's not you know i mean i don't, I don't do this anymore but you know and as a librarian my, my job was to help people find things i'm all all about helping people find things um, so when you create an experience that gets them to what they need the most, I mean, that's important to me. Um, and uh, side, side ant anecdote um, is, um, so, because uh, I'm younger daughter technical support to my parents. And so, yeah, and I even answer the phone that way sometimes when I see them phone number and my mom was really frustrated um, because she couldn't find a particular form on a, a you know the, the retirement plan that they use and um and I couldn't find it either and I'm like I don't know I think you're gonna have to call support and they actually um they had told her when she finally called them that they had removed that piece of content because nobody ever filled out the form correctly um and so and she's like well can you send it and then she filled it out and they sent it, she sent it back and they're like, you filled out the form correctly, which didn't make her particularly happy because she's like, she had to go through all these extra steps in order to finish whatever she needed to do. And, and so when you think about it in terms of, you know, support and what you're trying to, you know, you, you want to make people happy because, it's, 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 you know, um, I buy products based on their, um, their level of support. Um, I buy um, certain web host, uh, web hosting service because I get people when I get on the phone, they know what they're talking about and they don't mansplain. And that's important to me. I, you know, I've, I've been in IT for God knows, you know, how long. I don't need to be told what you know, how to turn a computer on and off, off and on again. So, you know, so we have those, you know, the, those that, that, on, and that's my bias and that's my baggage and that's my background and I'm okay with that. And, you know, if I get a 20 year old who tells me that, you know, of what I need to do and I told him I already did it, I'm like, can I talk to your supervisor? Um, it's so, yeah, so it's, it's very much, uh, you know, in, you know, part of that wrapping it all together for certain. Thank you. This is really cool. I'm glad you liked it. Paula, did you have another question? I thought I heard. well, I, yeah, I do, and I think you kind of got to it with Heidi's question. Um, and I'm kind of back to sort of again, just sort of the tactical aspect of this, and thinking, uh, you know, it almost feels like there's sort of a you know, matrix here in a way of sort of like personalization and customer journey and empathy and yeah. personas and voice and tone. So we're getting into many dimensions here, but, but is it sort of correct to say that, you know, there's a scenario where you might have content that's, you know, 
written in different in a different style, you know, so that you know that if someone who is sort of this persona has gotten to this point, you know, yeah. you're going to serve them this version of it versus this version. Or if you know that it's an, you know, whatever you know about that person is going to affect, you know, is it an older person or a younger person? Is it someone coming from this context or that context? And so is that kind of what you're, you know, is that an accurate yeah. kind of depiction of how this could could really be yeah, instantiated? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And even in, well, and it's it's not quite there yet, but even in, in Ditta, there's a ta- there's a concept for audience. It's specific. So you can write in the same piece of content, okay, if it's this audience, you say this. If it's that audience, you say that. I mean, it, and it allows you, it makes for a more complex writing approach because you have to write sentences in a different way to approach or paragraphs or, you know, sections or topics or whatever um, in a different way to address, you know, your your different audiences or your different personas. But yeah, you you definitely, um, if you wanted to go to that level, you definitely could and, and it, but it's a cost. And I think that's the biggest barrier, honestly. I mean, all of this stuff, it's a lot of work. Um, and are organizations willing to front the money and the time in order to do this? And that's yeah, a big yeah. unknown. Well, and there's a, it's a whole other conversation, right, about sort of the ROI of this, right, which is, you sure. know, if you don't have angry people calling on the phone or saying, I don't know how to fill out this form or whatever, then, yeah. then you've saved some money, but it's hard to show those benefits kind of up front. Well, but even, but a lot of, a lot of people, particularly, you know, in these times, um, you know, they're focusing on, they want people to self-service. They want people to not call in. And that's actually a metric that, you know, our call in numbers have gone down because people are going to the website or whatever and getting what, you know, what they need. And they're not calling and taking up phone time with the support team. And that is a definite metric. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I do want to be um, cognizant that it is that Rebecca is calling in from Massachusetts and it's late for her. Uh, and I think we're, we're kind of seeing people um, needing to drop. So I, I think with that, unless anyone has another burning question, we'll maybe wrap it up there. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Really fascinating topic. Um, and appreciate your being, uh, your being with us and, uh, we will, to everyone who is, who is still here, we will share Rebecca's slides. Um, and as I mentioned before, we are recording this, so we'll make the recording available when we have it kind of ready to go. Um, please do feel free to, you know, um, let your, your coworkers and friends know if they're interested in this topic. And uh, keep an eye on our, on our meetup site and on our Slack channel and everything. And we'll um, hope to see you uh, in... May for our next event. Okay.